Hey, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. Uh, Glad you could make it. Hope you're enjoying uh, whatever you think this is right now. I can't call it spring. I can't call it winter. It's splinter, which is what a lot of the trees around here are doing. Yeah, they're falling apart in all the wind. And if they're not, they're tipping over because the ground is saturated. But that's my problem, not yours. Here are some of the things we will cover today, and I'm so looking forward to it. First on the list, our primary guest today is Land Tawny. Yeah, with a name like that, he better be involved in a conservation group. He is the CEO of the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. He'll bring us up to date on what that organization is doing, and uh, maybe you'll decide that it's worth your dues dollars. They are doing some creative things that are, you know, having a real effect on us, but you'll you'll learn from the the guy in charge over there. So stand by for Land Tawny. Our handle segment will talk about some of the essential training tools that new puppy owners need to get into their kit real soon. And then I asked you recently, uh, if you hate your dog food, you know, where's your loyalty in that regard? I'll take that survey and uh, outline it a little bit more, maybe even expound upon it right here at the Upland Nation podcast. It's made possible by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products. Pointer Shotguns, Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School, True Lock Choke Tubes, MidwayUSA.com, and FindBirdHuntingSpots.com. Well, you remember that uh, barbed wire incident uh, Flick had a while back? Yeah, he's doing fine. In fact, except for the shorter wire hair on the spots where they did the stitching. Kind of hard to tell anything happened to him. He never lost any of his desire. In fact, he's doing more miles now than he's done in a long time in our workouts. And I'm encouraged by that. Um, It's uh, it's pretty nice to know that, um, uh, you know, those kind of things really are not a big deal to a dog. Uh, Have you ever noticed how I guess I'll call it stoic. Pain? It's got to be really bad before it bothers a dog. Had that happen enough times to realize that most dogs would rather hunt than just about anything else. Uh, You've probably seen the same thing. So anyway, we're working on steadiness. Yeah, (laughs) to rabbits, deer, squirrels, and of course birds. Lots of pigeons. They're um, multiplying like rabbits in my loft and that's a good thing because uh, i'm using them more and more they're handy and uh, some of the younger ones are perfect for what we're doing now and that is birds on the ground moving around yeah you know how hard it is to get a bird to stand still when you want it to or to not fly off when you don't want it to that's what we're working on the younger birds are perfect for that and flick is getting better and better at steadiness on that soon If we're lucky, the quail will come back and uh, we'll be working on game birds as well. Right now, thank you, pigeons. Appreciate your help. What about you? You know, I was curious. And uh, why, why you do or think what you do is always of interest to me. And I appreciate your feedback on that stuff, whether it's social media or you take the poll in my weekly Upland Nation Insights newsletter. Here's one that I, I kind of had a gut feel for, and uh, sure enough, it's true. I asked um, about your dog food. Do you love it or hate it? And uh, would you switch, given a better choice? Yeah, that's right. Over 45% of you said, uh, I got no loyalty. Find me another good one, I might switch. 24% were rock solid, loyal as they can be. And then another 30% said, yeah, you know, whether it's price, value, nutritional content, main ingredients, I'd consider a switch as well. So let's see if I do the math. 47, 75% of you might move given the right incentives. 
Well, to me, that says you're always looking out for your dog's best interest, uh, whether it's being able to feed him a, a better product, uh, more healthful, higher protein, however you define it, whatever it is, you're looking for something that will serve your dog better. So good on you. Glad to hear it. And um, thanks for all of you who continue to take those polls. It's kind of fun. And, and I realize, yeah, you look forward to it as much as I do when the results come out. So I will continue to publish the results along with a new poll almost every week. Once in a while, I, I don't, but most of the time I do. Thanks a lot. We're brought to you in part by PointerShotguns.com. As you might remember, at the Pheasant Fest and Quail Classic, uh, they debuted their 12-gauge side-by-side shotgun, and boy, did it get some real attention. And that one, like many other Pointer Shotgun models, is now available with case coloring. So whether you want it, well, what do I call it, normal, bluing, blacking, or you want one of those cool Cerakote finishes, or you want that beautiful case coloring. It's all there for you, whether it's a side-by-side, an over-and-under, an automatic. Uh, they're all available at PointerShotguns.com. Find your nearby retailer at PointerShotguns.com. And store that new Pointer Shotgun in a Sage and Breaker shotgun case. Yeah, heirloom quality, you're going to be handing it down. It's beautiful. Highest craftsmanship made in the USA. It's available now at sageandbreaker.com, as is the brand new range bag. Yeah, at some point, it's time to go up scale, find something that uh, that is worthy of your uh, equipment and of your lifestyle, and that range bag is a perfect example. Not cheap but a great value. And like I said, it'll last a lifetime. Learn more about the new range bag, all the other great storage and cleaning um, accessories, plus uh, supplies, whether they're tools, uh, CLP to clean and lubricate your gun. The cleaning mat is one of my favorites. You'll see why. Just take a look at sageandbreaker.com. Well, here we are at the, uh, let's see, what are, what are we calling this thing now? Pheasant Fest and Quail Classic here in Minneapolis. I'm joined here in the Legacy Sports Pointer Shotgun booth by Lan Tawney. Lan, you're the CEO and uh, the, you're the grand poobah for the backcountry <laughs> hunters and anglers. Uh, a lot of people aren't familiar with that organization. Uh, why don't you just acquaint us first with what you're doing and why you're doing it? Totally, and thanks for having me. You're welcome. So... We are an organization that fights every single day to make sure you have access to public lands and public waters and then the fish and wildlife habitat when you get there. Yeah. When I think about this country and what separates us from everybody else in the world is that public lands belong to we the people. And so our organization tries to make sure that you have access again to those lands, public lands and public waters to hunt and fish and like anybody that's listening to this that doesn't hunt or fish, maybe you want to go pick huckleberries. Maybe you want to go do wild rice, right? Like. But that's available to all of us. 640 million acres you and I own. And so we make sure every day that you have access to those places. You know, uh, you make a good point. In most of the world, uh, wildlife and land are all privately owned. Yes. Here we don't have that. Uh, how do you, ha- what are some of the primary uh, activities that backcountry hunters and anglers uh, engages in? Sure. So we work... In many different ways, but I would say that we work on legislative things that are at every single state legislature across the country. We work out in Washington, D.C., again, to work, make sure you have access to public lands and waters. We also now are doing much more like stewardship projects, and so we're enhancing public lands. And and by that, I mean either cleaning them up because people leave garbage there, or we're, you know, repairing and restoration opportunity. We're doing all those things. And so... uh, We try to, at every single level, engage with the decision makers that are responsible for managing these public lands for us. So it's a pretty fun thing. 
It is, and, and a great organization. You've not been around very long. How, how old is the organization? So it started in 2004, mm-hmm. so, and uh, I took over uh, 10 years ago. And when I took over, there was only 1,000 members, and we had no full-time staff. I was the first full-time staff member. Now we have 30,000 people across the country. We have chapters in every single state besides Delaware and Hawaii. And Delaware, maybe like I can get why we're not there, but Hawaii is like a public land state. So I, yeah. I'm really confused that we don't have one there yet. Well, you'll have to make some research trips. I, I think that's what I need to do. I think that's what I need to do. This time of year. Yeah, totally, yeah. totally. I get away from the cold, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, why would somebody want to join an organization like this? I think, you know, like, we are we have a community, yeah. which is amazing. And I think that, that no matter who you are, where you come from, we will welcome you to the table and, like, have a conversation about how you can be involved with us. And I think that, like, we just did an, uh, an event up in uh, northern Minnesota. And I'm going to get this wrong. I say it wrong every time. I'm trying to learn it. But it's like Mills Lake. Lake. Millilac. God, I, every time. I think. <laughs> but we had this opportunity to, to actually go ice fishing up there, and it was, like this, it was called the Icebreaker, and there was 160 people that showed up. Middle of winter, the amount of fun that we had, the amount of energy, the amount of things that we learned was absolutely amazing. And so, like, we will do that not just here in Minnesota, but all across the country and invite you into our tent. And what you see is what you get, you know? And, like, what you put into it is what you get as well. You know, you don't have to be a fly fisher or a bird hunter or a deer hunter. You could be any of those or none of those, right? Totally. It, it doesn't matter. I and mean, as I talked about earlier, you know, backcountry hunters and anglers, so we're hunters and anglers. But if you like getting out and you know, picking huckleberries, you like going and picking wild rice, you know, any of those things, we are trying to make sure that you have those opportunities forever. And if you don't care about that stuff, Clean air and clean water is pretty darn important, and that is what public lands and public waters really do for you. Backcountry seems to be the operative word, though. There's a, a little bit of uh, um, DIY ethic in sure. here, isn't there? Sure. So I think think about the challenge that you, the challenge and the adventure on public lands. I can go into the boundary waters here in northern Minnesota, and I can challenge myself in so many different ways. And it's like, it's this amazing piece. That's that, that's that backcountry to me. Like, what is your backcountry? It's what, where you get challenged, where you find solace. And this whole, you know, COVID that we just all went through, where did I actually feel right is when I went out in the woods and on the water, you know? And like, that to me is backcountry. And so that could be your backyard. That can be these big, you know, open spaces. I live in Montana. My favorite piece of backcountry is Bob Marshall Wilderness. It's 1.1 million acres. It's absolutely an amazing place to go. But that doesn't have to be the only place that we actually talk about it. It's just like where you can find your solace, I think, is, is, is in particular, is what we would consider backcountry. So backcountry <coughs> with uh, quotation marks uh, might be At some might point, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I think, it, like, what is it, you know, and, and I, I get the opportunity to travel all around the country. So I've talked a lot about Minnesota, but... Go to North Carolina. North Carolina, their backcountry is like from the coast all the way to the Blue Mountains. And so you find those places that just provide you that solace and like that adventure and that opportunity to get out and explore. That's what backcountry is to me. So it's almost a philosophy. Absolutely. That's a thank you. That's a that's a, great. Feel free to steal that. Yeah, that was great. It was like a, <laughs> that's a T-shirt, like in the Don't, making. Okay. In the in the making. Send me one. I will give you. I will give you like, like all the proper uh, uh, hey, acknowledgement if you do that. Yeah. So so you a million times a year somebody says how how coincidental how coincidental is it that a guy named Land <laughs> is working at Access to Land. So, uh, this is kind of funny. I, uh, Land Lindbergh is who I'm named after. And that has a very specific connection to Minnesota. He flew the Spirit of St. Louis across, you know, the Atlantic Ocean, right? But he, he, like, he, Charles Lindbergh, I guess is who did that. But Land Lindbergh lives in Montana. And so I'm named after him specifically. Wow. And so, as a kid... Did I like my name? No. Like, I got made fun of just like everybody else does, you know? I mean, like, we could make fun of your name right now. Yeah. Kids find ways to pick at you. Lamb was really particularly hard for me. 
but about fifth grade when I got my first fist fight, and I was like, okay, nobody's going to like talk about my name anymore. Yeah. Now I've embraced it, and so is it. I, I've gotten in front of crowds before, and like I said, I changed my name uh, because of the work that I do, and they're all like, "What?" <laughs> but no, it's 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 very it's 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 apropos that I'm doing this work, and like my you know my parents, you know, back in the day, Land Lindbergh is who I'm named after, and it comes to me very honestly. Foreordained, you're a, like a boy named Sue. <laughs> you, you, I you, love you that learned, song, by the way. That. I love yeah. that song. It's uh, one of my favorites. It's well, one of my favorites. Uh, yeah. Look up Shell Silverstein. Uh, he did a lot of them like that. He, yeah. he wrote that one. But uh, so give us an example of, of one of the kind of the showcase projects you guys are working on at Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. So there's one down in Arkansas that I would highlight right now. And this is kind of a new thing for us. But I think it's a, something that hopefully we do more. So Onyx, we all know who Onyx is now. We all carry these phones. And it tells you where access is in different places, right? And it gives you the great opportunity to explore. It also shows you where you may not have access to certain places. And so Onyx was able to give, down in Arkansas, was able to give all the data about inaccessible public land. Organization then said, okay, tell us what we, we can do to make more, more accessible. So the Arkansas Department of Fish and Game came to us and said there was an acre, one acre, it's one acre, Scott, like one acre, that will open up 30,000 to state and then another 130 to like federal ground. And so we're working right now and I, hopefully those folks are listening right now and like I'm not getting out in front of us a little bit, but like it's, we are talking to that landowner right now to provide access to those 30, then the, another 130. Yeah. One acre, Scott, one. And so, like, that is all across the country. There's Absolutely. these opportunities that are going to yeah. happen. Yeah. And so I think once we announce this, and we kind of are right now, that more people are going to talk about, well, what, what about in my state? What about in my little, like, and, and so to me, it's a, it's a very uh, signature issue for us that I hope, uh, I hope that just breeds more, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and... Do you expect members to be a part of the effort to do that, what I'll call semi-political work, too? Um, there's some things they can do well. Other things maybe ought to be left to a professional. I think that uh, I say this a lot is that you're either at the table or you're on the menu. <laughs> Yeah, and I so if it. we're not at the table, yeah. Yeah. And, and so what we try to do is we try to encourage our members to always be a part of the conversation. Because if we're not, somebody else is having that conversation, right? And so that, then you're on the table. Like, they're eating you. If we, the people, can actually engage in the conservation and be a part of the conversation, we're not going to win them all, but we're going to actually be there to actually have that conversation. So to me, that is what we try to do all the time is just bring people to the table to have the conversation mm -hmm. whether that's about access whether that's about habitat whatever that is we the people have to be a part of that and if you look at the history in this country we the people have stepped up all the time i mean what we were talking about like public lands public wildlife they belong to the people that didn't happen by accident people from all across this country step, stepped up and said, we want to be a part of this. And so that's what we do. That's really what we do. That's Lan Tawney. He's the CEO for the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. I'm Scott Linden. We're here at the Pheasant Fest and Quail Classic in Minneapolis where we recorded this conversation. Wide ranging. We're going to talk about tips on public access after the break. But before we do, um, it's the running joke in our area uh, uh, backcountry hunter backcountry hunters and anglers has a particular affinity for social <laughs> events that include my favorite liquid um, what, what do you do with these uh, these beer gatherings that you we call them pint, pint nights. nights we call them yeah, pint nights yeah. and and really I mean I talked about it earlier but it's a community yeah if you can come in and have a beer around folks it's like we can have a conversation about whatever you want to talk about. And so it's this welcoming place. And that's why we really are trying to do that is that have these gatherings that bring folks together in a way that, you know, they feel comfortable. And mm -hmm. <laughs> who knew? Yeah. But like beer brings people yeah. together, you know. And, <laughs> like, and they're immediately comfortable. Absolutely. 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 Uh, what did uh, Ben Franklin say? Beer is... Uh, 
is clear evidence that God loves us. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I know that quote. <laughs> I used to remember it better, but, but I, then I had too much beer. Hey, stick around. We're just getting warmed up here on the Upland Nation podcast. We're on the floor of the Minneapolis Convention Center talking to Lan Tawney of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. So stick around. We got more to cover, including a lot of public access tips right after this break. And we will have a lot more coming up, including another uh, stint with Land Tawny of the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, uh, as well as our must-have training tools for day one in your puppy's life at your house. So stick around for all of that after a word from TrueLockChokes.com. If you're one of the many folks who listen to this podcast and also hunt turkeys, take advantage of their sale. 15% off all Pinhoti turkey chokes through the end of April, just in time. Yeah, 15% off a very rare sale at truelockchokes.com. Just head there and look for the sale notifications. 15% off all Pinhoti turkey chokes through through April at truelockchokes.com. And, you know, I've got that uh, public access webinar. I've been doing this for 34 years, learned a little bit about how to find public ground, sometimes ground that you might not think about, as well as all the tips for utilizing that ground. It's all in a new webinar at findbirdhuntingspots.com is where you get the link. Just go there, findbirdhuntingspots.com, and the pop-up will direct you to the webinar page just for 95 I think it is five bucks for a, an hour's worth of public access tips money well spent believe me appreciate your support see you at findbirdhuntingspots.com All right, welcome back. Talking to Lan Tawney, the CEO of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. Let's start with how to how to learn more about you guys. What's the uh, website address? Backcountryhunters.org. So we don't include the anglers in that piece because it gets a little bit too long. And I, I apologize to all the anglers that are listening to this, but it's backcountryhunters.org. Uh, we won't take it personal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with, with, a, with an organization like this, whether it's finding a... Uh, one acre parcel that's blocking a whole bunch of other acres of public land. Sure. Or simply just being better at accessing public ground, period. Do you have any overall advice for us? I mean, if you don't have Onyx on your phone right now, yeah. you're losing out. Yeah. And so, I mean, great plug for them, but they have changed the game. And I will say that in my home state of Montana, I have found, I grew up there. I have found more ground that I didn't know that I had access to because of Onyx, and it's unbelievable. And I hunt north of Missoula, Montana, and in that spot, I can go out and upland bird hunt, and the, tri- like the tribe owns the Salish Kootenai on a bunch of ground, and they're starting to buy more and more and more ground all the time, which is amazing, putting it back into opportunities for you and I. And if on my phone, I get to see, like, where that is, where that is. And it's, 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 it's absolutely the most uh, uh, empowering kind of piece to be able to look at your phone. I can go there. I can't go there, but I can go here. And so Onyx, if you don't have Onyx, and again, it sounds like a commercial, and I'm, I, they're one of our corporate partners, and I get it. But it's changed my life in particular, and I think it's changed the whole game as far as how you get to access public land and public opportunities. So Onyx is a big one. And, and it's because just for some people who are um, you know, Luddites, uh, <laughs> it, it is an online yes. and mobile mapping app sure. that, it, that clearly illustrates what's privately held, what's publicly held, and it even tells us who owns the land when it's no Absolutely, matter, even, if, it, even if it's private, yeah. even if it's private. And I yeah. think, you know, I've, I hunt a lot in North Dakota. And North Dakota is a different state where you can uh, have public access to private land and they have to post it. If it's, if, and if they don't, then it's open. But it'll give you the, the, the name of the people so you can actually call those people and say, hey, 
I'm gonna go hunt waterfowl. Sometimes for pheasants, it's posted, and for like like uh, white tails in particular. Mm-hmm. White tails are a little bit different, but for for waterfowl in particular, man, I can go up there and I can scout birds. I can see a thousand birds that are working a field and go call that person and say, "Hey, I want to go hunt this place." And nine times out of ten, they're gonna say yes, which is Onyx is giving us those opportunities to have the conversations. You know, now for somebody who's just gotten the app, yeah. What's the biggest bit of advice that you would help us with to get started on an online mapping app? It's a good question. It's a good question. I think just explore, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and I think really, and I'm finding out stuff all the time myself, all the time. Yeah. Just look at that map and see these places where you can potentially go. And, and, and the idea, I think I would say uh, make sure you get the layers of the state, yeah. right? And so, like, you have all sorts of different things that you can ask that app to do for you get the state get the federal stuff and so that you know where public land is and and that will help you even more and then the private land stuff you know at some point again make the phone call make the phone call and they make that easier because they tell you who owns that piece of property by the way ben Bredingen, you owe me for this <laughs> but uh one of the things that that w- is real important to us as bird hunters in particular is is finding good habitat yeah uh you're out there you mentioned to one of the tribal organizations Sarah's yeah, 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 yeah. and we see that in other places south dakota has a lot of that yeah, yeah. whether whether it's a tribe or anybody else what are some of the key habitat components that you see when we're looking for any upland birds uh, i mean i think that to me the conservation piece of the farm bill is such an important thing and and so here's this federal program people don't like federal government and in general what the federal government has done for private landowners in this country is absolutely amazing and so to me finding places that aren't farm fence row to fence row that have the hedgerows on the side right like and when i'm going and hunting pheasants in particular i'm looking for habitat on the outside that is holding cover where they have protection. They can go eat over here. They have holding over here. And to me, that's what I'm looking for all the time. And so for those that are listening to this and want to go hunt more birds and be successful, and again, I'm not a genius. I don't know everything. But watch for that holding cover on the sides for in particular. And I, again, North Dakota, Montana, Minnesota, I've done it all. Find the stuff that's on the edges that are like holding these birds. That's that's what I would say. You know, I would add to that. Sometimes a holding cover is on private ground right next door. Totally. But if you time it right, the birds aren't in there. Totally. Because they're, they're, they're eating. Because they're eating, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you know a little bit about bird behavior, uh, it doesn't matter which side of the fence, literally, that good holding cover or roosting cover is. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, I... I and I, I mean, I think I've seen that so many times that what you just described, we all kind of know if you're out there, right? Is that kind of private to the public kind of interface, which those birds, they don't know what's public or private. They're just like eating. That's all they're doing. So just figure out where their kind of like patterns are and you'll find birds. You got a dog? I got a black lab. And, and she's, uh, her name's Thule. She's six years old. Out of all the dogs I've had, she's probably, it's my first female. Uh, I will never go back from a non-female anymore. I don't know, Scott, what you run, but like, I, I my hard-charging males, I loved them. They would do amazing things, but I had to deal with like the hard-charging male. Yeah. As a female, she looks at me and she just wants to serve all the time. And she's such an amazing dog. And so I don't think I'll ever go back. And it's uh, it's one of the most beautiful things I think right now that I have is like her and the only problem, and I will say it's a problem. She's got a hard mouth. Ah, that's a big problem. Did you force break her? I did not. And like and, I, and everybody like you know and I've I've done, I've done like the uh, frozen birds you know yeah, with her. So yeah. she like you know and and she'll do that and then she'll just munch stuff. And I think that her, if I go back to and this is like the beauty of like what we get to do but I get to go look back at like kind of where she came from she had a goose to beat her up live goose I shot it and it was like getting on her like with that yeah. like it's poking at her 
And I think she always remembers that, always remembers it. And so she wants to kill him. And so, like, yeah. she's like, she's just munching him because she just wants to put him down. And, oh, I agree. And it's hard. And, you know, and, and for a while, I was, you know, yelling at her when she was doing that. And then she stopped retrieving for a little bit. And I was like, well, that's your job to retrieve birds. And so, you know, uh, I can't pluck many birds because, like, she puts holes in them. <laughs> But I can breast out and I can leg out yeah. all of those birds, and so I'm still eating them all the time. But that's the it is a it's a weird thing, and I you know maybe I'll have a dog. At, you know, like with the beauty of dogs too, as you go through these in your life, you have so many different dogs. Is she my best right now? Yes. But could I get better at some point? Yes. So. We're all, we're always hoping for that. It's it's yeah. a dream, right? It's a yeah. dream. It's yeah. a dream. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, the, the German dogs. I'm a wire hair guy. They're always making sure that when the bird arrives, it's dead because they've been through that same thing. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the way we train them. If you're lucky, that's all they do is they quiet that bird down permanently. Right. And they don't swallow it. Right. They don't bury it. Right. Or they don't piece it out. Right. But I feel your pain. Well, (laughs) it's, uh, I will say, and like you talk about your dogs, as I get as I want to hunt more um, uh, sharp tails in particular, my lab can't cover that country. Mm-hmm. It can't. She can, if she does it, she's bumping birds, right? Yeah. Like she's out too far. When you have a dog that can like work that country and point, like I'm, I'm very close to going over to the other side right now. Come on down. And I'm like, you know, I don't, and I don't know what that looks like, but I kind of know what I want to do as a hunter. And I think that would be, and they can hunt waterfowl too. And so I can, I've been a lab guy my whole time. Well, you can still be a lab guy, <laughs> but you can also bring somebody else into the house. Um, I'm, you don't, know, don't forget that. I think that's like fair. That's yeah. fair. Uh, we're listening. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. That's Lan Tawney with Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. You know, um, there's the group that puts on this or this event. There's the group down the aisle there that has their own kind of constituency, and over there, there's another one. Why would somebody want to add to their list of organizations that they are a member of one more, particularly backcountry hunters and anglers? We're going to give you a voice. Yeah. We're going to give you a voice. I think that there's a lot of organizations that are focused on habitat in particular, which is very important, and I belong to them. We're different. We want your grassroots voice to be involved in the political system. And a lot of people don't think their voice counts anymore. And guess what? It doesn't unless you use it. You have to be able to use your voice. And all we're trying to do is give you an opportunity to use those voices. And so if you're a backcountry hunters and anglers member, we will tell you at a state level how you can engage to get better access, to get better habitat with the state legislature at a D.C. level. We will let you know how you can engage in that political system that a lot of people don't think they don't matter anymore, which I get, but how to get more habitat, how to get more conservation on the ground. And that's really what we do is try to make sure that you have a voice. So if you're listening to this, belong to Ducks Unlimited, belong to Pheasants Forever, belong to the Mule Deer Foundation. Awesome. Habitat work. Grassroots engagement and, and, and the legislative piece is what we do. We will give you a voice, and if you want to step up and use your voice, we will help you do that. So everybody who gripes and moans all the time ought to be a member. <laughs> that that armchair quarterback, right? Like, you know, like we're all sitting around, and like again, like I said it earlier, like be at the table, be part of the menu, man. Yeah. And if you're at the table, like, at least we have the ability to have the conversation. Yeah. And so that's what we're trying to do every single day is give you an opportunity to be a part of the conversation. Yeah. Lead, follow, or get out of the way. That's another great way to say it. That's another great way to say it. Oh my God! It's not. It's like it's it's. There's more and more that we're gonna get. Like like one more shirt. Like we. That's two. Let's get three. (laughs) Backcountry hunters and backcountry hunters and anglers. Backcountryhunters.org is where you learn more. Even if you're an angler, and um, land it. It's so. It's so wonderful to see the organization growing so much. What is your number one? organizational goal for for the near future that's interesting so as you ask that to me i'm thinking and i'm trying to figure out what is the best thing to talk about here i i would say and this one is not super sexy scott it's 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 but i think the people need to know about it so 
conservation in this country has been driven by hunters and anglers in particular. And we have this amazing, amazing restoration that has happened in this country about any kind of species. There's a bunch of species that we don't know about and uh, enhance our experiences when we're out in the woods. But there's a bill right now out in Washington, D.C., and it's called the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. What that will do is make sure that species that are common stay common and other species don't go on the endangered species list. When they go on the endangered species list, that costs money and it has a lot of regulation on top of that. This money that will come from this bill will not only support those species that we don't know about, but it will also support the species that you and I care about and that we chase around. You know? and, and, and to me, like, you know, when I'm out, and these, these species aren't in trouble, but I will say that like, I will just make a point. Is that when I see a great blue heron like in my decoys and it blows up and it makes that ah, like we all it's like a pterodactyl sound that enhances my whole time. When I see a kingfisher that flies by, catches a fish, flips it up in the in the air and, and in its mouth, that is I will never hunt those things and I don't want to hunt those things. But does it enhance my experience? Absolutely. Is it part of like the Aldo Leopold like kind of like the idea that all parts matter of the biological community? Absolutely. And so us as hunters. Hopefully we understand that, like, this is, besides the things we chase around, this community really is important. And so this is a way to get some more money to those species that are forgotten. We do know about them. We know that it's a great blue heron, and we know that it's a kingfisher, and we sure. know that it's a, uh, you know, a uh, red, red-winged blackbird. Yeah. But we don't, they're not on our conservation radar screen. Is that what you mean? That's totally what I mean. Yeah. And so, and so, and, and how important those things are to the overall community. Again, Aldo Leopold, all parts matter. This is a way to make sure that those species that we've kind of not paid attention to are actually paid attention to. So, Recovering America's Wildlife Act. What's, Look a, at, what's the status today? So we, had, so, we had a bill that was passed in the House, and the Senate was very close to doing something in this last Congress. During lame duck, after the elections, we thought we were gonna get some movement. Now, this next year, so right now, it's going to be introduced again. And all we need to do as the people is say, we want this to go forward. And so make a phone call. Like BHA will make that very easy for you to either send an email or make a phone call. And right now, I mean, I'm knock on wood, but I I really feel confident that we can actually get this done this next year. All right. So become a member. Learn all about it. Express your interest, your passion for wildlife in general, access in general. You make it easy, and that's what we're looking for these days. Land Tawny, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, thanks for being a part of the Upland Nation podcast. Oh, oh man, Scott, this has been a joy for me. Like, Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to even you're, talk about this stuff. You're always welcome. All right, appreciate you. Yeah, we've still got our handle it segment coming up. That'll be essential training tools for puppy owners, uh, whether it's you or you're helping somebody else with their puppy. I'll give you the condensed version if you want the whole thing. Well, then you need to go to MidwayUSA.com. Yeah, they're getting a bunch of my articles exclusively written for them and them alone. Same with some videos. But here's a couple of articles that might be worthwhile to you. Letting your training tools take the blame. Yeah, are you intrigued? I thought it'd be fun to write that. And it was. And then what's in my dog care kit? You know, uh, especially after what happened with Flick and that barbed wire fence. Uh, There's some things in there that might be of value to you as well. And let me remind you that MidwayUSA.com, they carry just about everything for shooting, hunting, and the outdoors. Just made another order myself. You know, they've got more and more Upland gear on a day-to-day basis. They're adding stuff from new brush pants to dummy launchers to boots. Just got a new pair of boots from MidwayUSA.com. And Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School is where I put all of that new gear to the test. I'm taking a lesson periodically out there. I'm having fun at all of their clay target games, from five stand to sporting clays to trap and skeet. 
It's all there, plus instruction, of course. Go to midvalleyclays.com, take a look at their pro shop assortment as well, and maybe you want to schedule a lesson or just come on out and shoot with me or everybody else out there. It's at Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School, midvalleyclays.com. Handle it. Yeah, this time of year, everybody's got their mind on uh, dog training, whether it's your current dog or a new dog that's just coming into the kennel, uh, young or old, in between. I keep getting asked the same question, what are the most important pieces of gear that you need? And so I wrote that piece for MidwayUSA.com, and uh, you can get the, um, the whole list there. But here's the start things you may not have thought about that really will pay off in the long run. A training table, some people call it a woe table, whatever you call it, saves your back. Makes pup just a little bit nervous and more likely to pay attention to you. And a crate, that's where a pup should sleep, eat, and spend time when you need a break. Make it all positive and then of course travel your dog in a crate as well. Teach them to enter come out only on command and save yourself a world of heartache over the years. Finally, a tie-out stake. That'll teach pup to yield to the collar, and that comes in handy anytime you're doing leash work, whether it's woe or heel. It's also a safe place to put your pup when you're working on something else. Just don't ever leave him unsupervised out there. Yeah, the whole list includes a lot of other things and uh, a new truck to carry it all. If you want all the details, go to MidwayUSA.com. Yeah, thanks, Land Tawny of the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers for all you do and uh, all the information you bestowed on us. Keep up the good work. Thanks to everybody who comments at social platforms. If you take the survey at my Upland Nation Insights newsletter, all the more so. If you left a rating or a review, remember that's how we grow. So please do it the next time you're on your podcast provider's site. And then, of course, thank you to Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School, and True Lock Chokes. Dot com. They're the folks who make this all possible. Without them, we couldn't do it. And without that, then you wouldn't have it. So uh, I wouldn't be here to serve you, and I sure appreciate doing that. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Scott Linden. See you at the range. <laughs>